Hello everyone, welcome guys. And as we were seeing structure of atom in our previous videos, last lecture I ended up by giving you few questions. And first we will start with those questions, then we will go for the revision, and then we will move for the next part, which is above principle and other quantum numbers. So before that, I'll read out the question first. Write down the options on the board, and then we will try to solve the question. Okay. So the first question which I gave you was what will be the wave number i have given you options also in previous video but today we will be directly starting to solve the example so the first question is what will be the wave number of yellow radiation having wavelength 240 nanometers as we know that the formula for wave number is wave number is represented by nu dash which is equal to 1 by lambda unit of lambda is what centimeters two and we are having lambda given as 240 nanometers we can use this into meters also so 240 nanometers is equal to what 240 into 10 raised to minus 9 meters so substituting this value of frequency substituting this value of frequency we will get the answer and that answer will be what 1 upon 240 into 10 raised to minus 9 this minus 9 will go up and it will be become 10 raised to 9 and we will when we will try to solve this we will get the answer as 4.0.00416 into 10 raised to 9 this will be the answer and it will be per meter because we have used the unit as meter over here I have not changed it into centimeter, so I will use this as per meter. Now shifting the point, and if I will write this as 4.16 into 10 raised to, it will be plus 6, 10 raised to plus 6 will be the answer because we are shifting three points to left hand side, means we can write down this as 4.16 into 10 raised to minus 3 into 10 raised to 9. So, on multiplying, we will get this answer as 10 raised to 6 per meter or hertz. This is the unit and answer for per meter. In our options, I have given you the option as per meter. That is the unit which I have given. And uh, this is our answer 4.16 into 10 raised to 6 per meter. Then I will now read out the next question what will be the energy of a photon which corresponds to the wavelength of 0.5 Armstrong? here we are provided with wavelength and we want to find out the energy of the photon we are knowing that e is equal to h nu this is our formula for energy so by using this formula you will be saying that we are provided with lambda and i am saying that value is provided as nu or our formula is e is equal to h nu and lambda is given nu is not given and what is the lambda it is uh, wavelength is 0 0.5 armstrong 0 0.5 armstrong means it will be 0 0.5 into 10 raised to minus 10 meters okay this is our wavelength now we know that this frequency is given as c by lambda e is equal to h c by lambda frequency is replaced by c by lambda now we know these values h is Planck's con constant 6.626 into 10 raised to minus 31 into 3 into 10 raised to 8 and lambda is 0 0.5 into 10 raised to minus 10 so while we will be substituting these values and trying to solve we will get the answer as we can shift this point over here we can uh, interchange it or you can keep it as it is it is up to you this will become 10 raised to 18 and 10 raised to 18 minus 31 will give me 10 raised to minus 18 minus 31 will give me 10 raised to minus 16 it will be what 10 raised to minus 16 this is the exponential value which we have got and what will be the magnitude magnitude will be 0 
zero point three nine eight into ten raised to minus sixteen. On shifting the point, we will get this as three point nine eight into ten raised to the minus sixteen power. And the units which are given to us in the textbook are all joules. So the unit will be joules. Energy is always calculated in joules. So this is the energy of the photon. So what will be the energy of a photon? So this will be the energy of a photon. Now in these examples, you will understand that we are trying to solve in many different ways, and we are going to find out the energy of a single photon. This is the energy of a photon, which is very important. Okay. Next, I'll read out the next question. The energy difference between the ground state of an atom and its excited state is. What is the wavelength of the photon required for this transition? What is the wavelength of the photon required for this transition? So, first I will explain the question which is given to you by diagram. The energy difference between the ground state of an atom and its excited state. Now, let us say this is the nucleus. I am having these orbits. My electron is at ground state. It is moving at excited state, and on de-exciting, it will need some energy. So find the blink होते थे. Now in this we can say that this is ground state, and the third orbit. Will be excited state. The question is, what will be the energy of? The question is, what energy difference between the ground state and an excited atom? What is the wavelength of the photon required? The energy difference between the ground state of an atom. The energy difference between the ground state of an atom and excited state means this energy difference is provided to us. This is represented by delta. E. This is the energy difference which is provided to us, and what else is given? It is three into ten raised to minus nineteen joules. Three into ten raised to minus nineteen joules. Next, what is given? What is the wavelength of the photon required for this transition? Now they have asked us that as we have provided you this energy difference, as this energy difference is provided to us. What will be the energy required to excite an electron from its ground state to excited state? This is the question which is asked. As we know that delta E is equal to h nu, according to the Bohr's theory, delta E is equal to h nu. So based on that, we can say that nu is equal to what? Delta E is equal to h c by lambda. Based the same equation which we have used in previous example. We know the value of c. We have to find out lambda. We are knowing the value of delta e. So by rearranging, lambda is equal to h c upon delta e. Lambda is equal to 6.626 into 10 raised to minus 34 into 3 into 10 raised to minus 8. Sorry, never minus 8 upon delta e. 3 into 10 raised to minus 19. Three three will get cancelled. Nineteen will go up, and it will add up. So nineteen plus eight, it is twenty-seven. So it will be what ten raised to plus twenty-seven. So on rearranging, twenty-seven and thirty-four. When we will subtract them, it will be seven. So lambda is equal to what six point six two six into ten raised to seven. And minus seven. Sorry, here we are having minus thirty-four with us. Here we are having minus thirty-four, so minus sign will remain as it is. So it will be ten raised to minus seven, and that is what uh, it is. D fourth option, and the unit for this lambda is what in meters. Okay. In this way, it was our third example. Then we are going to solve fourth example. What is the velocity of electron present in first Bohr's orbit of hydrogen atom? Again, I am reading out the example. What is the velocity of electron present 
in first bore orbit of hydrogen atom we are knowing the formula for that they have asked us velocity so v is equal to 2.6 into 10 raised to 10 raised to 6 into z by n this is the formula 2.18 velocity is equal to 2.18 into 10 raised to 6 z by n that is the yes z by n this is our formula where z is atomic mass and n is the shell number of that shell now the question is based on this formula what are the values given to us they have said first bore orbit and hydrogen atom means n is 1 because of first bore orbit and z is equal to 1 because it is hydrogen atom so substituting we will get that v is equal to 2.18 into 10 raised to 6 that is the velocity and it is in meters per second that is what in meters per second this is the velocity of the electron velocity of the electron moving the speed of that electron moving in the orbit of hydrogen atom present in first shell so if this is the velocity of that electron then is it possible for us to precisely tell the position and momentum of that electron it will be very difficult that's why heisenberg gave us its heisenberg uncertainty principle and based on that we have seen examples in our previous lecture okay now we will be solving our last example according to Bohr's theory the angular momentum of an electron in fifth orbit is according to Bohr's theory the angular momentum of electron in fifth orbit is we all have seen the formula when I was explaining you about the uh, Bohr's atomic model and when I was giving you the formula we have related centripetal force and centrifugal force before going for that part i have given you the formula for mvr is equal to h upon 2 pi so based on that we are going to use this formula mvr is equal to nh upon 2 pi where n tells us the shell which is present in that and the shell which they have asked us is fifth orbit means fifth shell so value of n will be phi substituting that value mvr is equal to phi h upon 2 pi and on dividing we will get 2.5 h by pi mvr is equal to 2.5 h by phi and this is the answer and that answer is fourth option i will read out the option once again for you all so the first answer for first question is 4.16 into 10 raised to 9 this is the first answer sorry 10 raised to 6 per meter then the next option is 3.98 into 10 raised to minus 15 joules then the next question its option is 6.6 .6 into 10 raised to minus 7 meters then it is 2.8 into 10 raised to 6 meters per second and the last answer is 2.5 h by pi so in this way we have solved uh, five different examples now we will be moving for the quantum numbers which we have slightly introduced in our previous video there are four quantum numbers principal quantum number azimuthal quantum number magnetic quantum number and spin quantum number so these four quantum numbers we are going to study and based on that i have given you shapes that s has spherical shape p has dumbbell shape d has uh, double dumbbell shape and f is distorted so these are the shapes of the orbitals what does these shape explain us that we will see today so based on that based on quantum mechanics and schrodinger wave equation we know that psi is the wave function of electron 
and that remains as it is where h psi h psi is equal to e psi where h is operator means we can either deri take derivative integration or whatever that is the operator which is present psi is the function of electron e is the energy output and psi is the function of electron which remains unchanged so based on that few mathematical calculations were carried out and on those mathematical calculations few shapes were cross checked and the concept was given that those shapes explain the probability of finding the electron in the atom probability of finding the electron in the atom close to the nucleus that was explained by the shapes which we will be seeing today so s has spherical shape means what let us take an analogy if i am having an atom present with me this is all theoretical what i am telling you is i am telling you the concept for you to understand and an analogy i am having a single atom i am having a photo um, camera a camera which can zoom in at a such a smaller level at such a smaller level that we can locate the electron okay means we can take the photograph of nucleus and electron that does not exist but in imagination we can make it appear now i am taking many photographs n number of photographs i took first photograph and under that photograph i got the position of electron here and the nucleus is present over here in first photograph i got the position of electron over here in second photograph here now i am having different photographs and on each and every photograph in each and every photograph i have found the position of that electron at different places now i club all those photographs 1 lakh or n number of photographs i club them and i found that the density of that electron the density of that electron probability of finding that electron is in this region now if you will see here you can observe that the nucleus is at the center and the probability of finding the electron is throughout the nucleus so this is for 1s what we are going to do we are going to see that what is 1s what is 2s we are going to see but first try to understand what i am saying this is the energy distribution or the probability distribution of electron for 1s then this is the nucleus this is the first probability distribution of electron and then this is the second probability distribution of electron where in center you can see that at the central part there are no electrons present in this region this absence of electron is called as node and remaining part is called as antinode graphically graphically these shells are represented in different forms one we can say that s then this is probability distribution of electron here it is the maximum probability so we will have only one peak then we are having two peaks this is the probability of electron where zero is our origin means this is the probability over here which i have drawn second is over here and here i am having what node where electron cannot be found if i am looking for 3s so the diagram will be like this where we are having three peaks here means i will have two nodes and three antinodes in this way 3s 4s orbitals are uh, these diagrams can be shown okay so next part is this is for 3s 1s 2s 3s right then we are having next part that is known as p which is having shape of 
dumbbell how come we can decide this that p orbital has dumbbell shape that is not decided it is based on mathematical calculations and observations so we can now again i will try to explain this in the form of distribution of electron it is based on probability distribu distribution of electron completely means this p block tells us that if this is the nucleus at the center then the electrons are concentrated in particular region means now if you will see you will see that at the center of the nucleus there is no probability of finding the electron electrons can be found majority in these regions only means if i will try to join these this is the probability distribution of electrons and here also i am having the probability distribution of electrons in this position so based on these photographs similarly as in previous lecture uh, sorry previous part we have seen s distribution of electrons for s shell or s orbital this is for p orbital where we can write down this in this shape we can draw this as a dumbbell shape based on the distribution of electrons okay this is for p block then we are having d shell where d shell is double dumbbell means there are two dumbbells present in d block okay and in this d block again the probability distribution of electron is at the corners so these corners explain us the probability distribution of electrons means this area contains high probability of finding an electron where electron cannot be found at the center because there is node present over there so in this way these shapes are decided based on the mathematical calculations and the observations which we have done now we are going to see these orbitals in three dimension i have shown you these orbitals in two dimension but how are they seen in three dimension because atoms are 3d they don't exist in two dimension they are three dimension means if i am saying that this is the nucleus and this is the s orbital this is not a circle but it will be a sphere means the probability will be like a ball surrounding that the surrounding the nucleus okay for example i'll give you an analogy we are using single tennis and double tennis balls right single tennis balls means what the atom is surrounded uh, sorry the electron is surrounded throughout that ball and the nucleus is at the center of that ball that is single tennis double tennis means what in the center there will be small ball on that there will be the probability of electron and in double tennis we have seen ball at the center and there is another covering that will be what for 2s as i have shown in previous video um, previous part right where there is a node and anti node means at the center there is a wide space that means what a small tennis ball small tennis ball ball means what the ball which uh, rubber ball which can bounce a lot which we call it as a bouncy ball that bouncy ball is placed at the center of that tennis ball that is what 2s in that way 3s we can try to understand so based on this analogy i hope you would have understood what is the concept behind it so this s is spherical like our ball tennis ball and it is known as s block so in three dimension we can show this as x y and z this is three dimensional representation for s block p orbital has two blocks means x y and z these are three axes p orbital has dumbbell shape this is with x axis this shape is with x axis this shape is with y axis and this shape is with z axis p orbital has three different axis px 
पी वाई एंड पी जेड ओरिएंटेशंस ऑफ पी और बैटल इज बेस्ड ऑन दिस थ्री डिफरेंट एक्सिस पी एक्स पी वाई एंड पी जेड एज इन प्रीवियस वीडियो प्रीवियस वीडियो आई हैव रिटर्न दैट एस कंटेंस वन ब्लॉक पी कंटेंस थ्री ब्लॉक्स एंड डी कंटेंस फाइव ब्लॉक्स बेस्ड ऑन दैट हाउ दोज थ्री ब्लॉक्स आर डिसाइडेड हाउ फाइव ब्लॉक्स वी हैव गॉट दैट वी विल सी बट दीज आर द शेप्स फॉर एस एंड पी देन वी आर हैविंग डी शेल वेर डी शेल हैज डबल डम्बेल एज इट्स शेप देर आर फाइव पार्ट्स ऑफ डी ब्लॉक और फाइव डिस्ट्रीब्यूशंस इफ आई एम हैविंग दिस एज एक्स वाई एंड जेड एक्सिस सो डी एक्स वाई विल बी नाउ दिस इज इन एक्स वाई एक्सिस लेट अस इमेजिन दैट आई एम हैविंग a wall we are sitting in a room you can pick any corner of your room okay i will pick the corner which i wish whichever pick now let us say i am having a room right now i can't show you that if imagine this is the corner of a room this direction will be z this direction will be x and top direction will be y now we are looking for x and y axis means we will be seeing front wall for me we will be seeing front wall and on that front wall we will have one lobe next to that wall we will have second lobe down we will have third lobe and fourth lobe in this way d block d block has its orbital again i am telling you x axis y axis and z axis axis pick any corner of your room hmm? give it x y z as its names we are trying x and y so in x and y we will draw one lobe that will be on the wall next we will have d y z d y z means one is y and this one is z so on y and z means we will draw orbital or draw lobe on the on this side of wall or my this side of wall means if i will draw in this way this is z and y means i will draw the lobe on this side 1 2 3 and 4 now looking at these figures you will see that this all these figures will seem to be as same because in two dimension it is very difficult to draw a three dimensional figure so for that i am giving you this explanation of the room x y z we have drawn x y on that wall next we have drawn y z on this wall next we are having x y so x and y means we will be drawing a lobe on the floor so x y means one one lobe this part of the lobe only this part of the lobe will be towards your side next part of the lobe will be beyond that wall okay and then simultaneously in this way you will have those lobes or for all four lobes distributed in that area okay these are three types of energy levels these are three energy levels of d orbital there are more two different energy levels of d orbital and those are x square minus y square d x square minus y square and d z square we have seen d z x means these five shapes of orbitals are we are going to see we have seen these three shapes now we'll be moving for next two shapes in that we will be drawing this lobe in the axis of x and y means here it is x y so we are going to draw these lobes in the axis of x and y 
so this is the shape for dx square minus y square which is in the axis next we have to draw shape for dz square so dz square can be drawn in this way like let us say this is my x y and z for my convenience i have drawn this z axis at the top so this is the lobe for z axis where each and every shape tells us the probability distribution of electron where the electrons can be found in an atom so in this way this is the shape for z orbital where electron density will be in the z axis so in this way we have seen the shapes of s p and d orbitals where f orbital is deformed and it does not have a particular shape okay so in this way we have seen different shapes of s p d and f now we will go for four quantum numbers and based on those four quantum numbers we will see how we can write the electronic configuration okay so there are four quantum numbers first one is principal quantum number then second one is azimuthal quantum number third one is magnetic quantum number and fourth one is spin quantum number in principal quantum number the representation is n where n is 1 2 3 and onwards it tells us the number of shells present in a particular atom these principal quantum numbers can also be related to the periods which are present in our periodic table if we are saying n is equal to 1 that means it is first period and electrons will be filled in first shell if we are saying n is equal to 2 that means it is second period and electrons will be filled only in second shell if n is equal to 3 that means the it is third period and third shell electrons will be filled in third shell and all the elements will be in that period also then if n is equal to 4 then there are there is fourth shell fourth shell means it is fourth period and we can fill 18 electrons in that in that particular shell that also tells us the periods or electron that also tells us the elements which are present in that particular period for example if i'll take n is equal to 1 only two electrons can be filled so first period contains two electrons if n is equal to 2 if n is equal to 2 it is second period eight electrons can be filled that's why in periodic table there are only eight elements if n is equal to 3 means it is m shell m shell has capacity of eight electrons in third period we will be having only eight elements n is equal to 4 capacity n shell has capacity of 18 electrons means in fourth period we are having 18 elements so based on the capacity of these shells the number of elements in that particular period is fixed i hope this will be this might be an interesting part for you so this is what period then peri this is principal quantum number then next we are having azimuthal quantum number that we will see in next video thank you